So I'm going to be talking tonight about riparian restoration on our rivers here in the desert southwest. And just to get a feel for where you guys are coming from, are there a lot of boaters or river recreationists in the room? Looks like a pretty active group, right? So there's a lot of you guys that get out and enjoy these rivers. So um, like Sarah mentioned, um, we're a small nonprofit based in Grand Junction, Colorado, and we have a staff of 10 people that work full time. And our mission is really to advance the restoration of riparian lands through education, collaboration, and technical assistance. So I think our name is a little bit of a misnomer and a little bit of confusion for some people because we're not just focused on Tamarisk. Um, that being said, I will talk a lot about it tonight. Um, we really envision healthy, functioning riparian ecosystems throughout the West that are supported by the communities and the residents that live in the areas that these rivers flow through. We work with several different partners. Um, we work with a lot of different federal, state, tribal, and local governments and agencies, a lot of different types of land managers, private citizens, uh, different watershed groups like the Middle Colorado Watershed Council, where we've got some representation tonight, universities and colleges, other nonprofits, and then we're also supported by different foundations and also partner with them on a lot of their activities as well. So to give you a scope of where we work, these are different watershed groups in the Four Corners area that we are currently working with to various degrees. Um, we, we really do work throughout the West wherever Tamarisk is located, but these are the groups that we're primarily partnering, on, um, partnering with right now. So I'm not sure how well you can see this map here, but um, you've got Grand Junction right here and then spreading down the Colorado um, River to the south there. So I won't spend too much time on the doom and gloom of what's the state of our western rivers, but just a reminder that we have lost a lot of our riparian areas, um, not only throughout the west, but especially here in Colorado. And a recent figure I saw was that up to 50% of our riparian and wetland acres have been lost in Colorado since um, settlement times here. And the causes of the changes to our riparian and wetland areas are due to a lot of different factors, including conversion um, into agricultural fields, residential or commercial development, um, gravel mining is especially prevalent where I work in Grand Junction. Um, reservoir or dam creation can have a huge impact on our, our rivers. Um, water diversions and then what I'll be focusing on tonight obviously is invasive plant infestations but a lot of these other factors have contributed to why invasive plants are thriving on our rivers um, today. So I'm going to focus on um, primarily tamarisk and Russian olive, but other species that we deal with include tree of heaven, which um, isn't too prevalent around here or in the, in the Grand Valley area where it's, it's warmer, um, but you will see it. And then Siberian elm is um, another plant that we have a huge issue with. And then a lot of weeds that you'll see co-dominant with these woody plants include Phragmites. There's an invasive um, version of Phragmites, and there's also a native. Um, giant reed, Russian knapweed, Hoary crust, which is also known as white top, and then perennial pepperweed. So these are the ones we deal with on a pretty daily basis. If you're not familiar with Russian olive, you're lucky. Um, it's a smaller tree that can form really dense monocultures, or you can find it more singularly too. And I just read that it was brought to the U.S. by Mennonites in the 1800, which I didn't quite realize. And it was, and it still is in some areas, planted for shade and wind protection. So out east, you can see these huge hedgerows of Russian olive, and a lot of people like it for that purpose. So it's not, you know, as simple as saying, yeah, and it, it smells good and it does provide some habitat and, and seeds. So there's some mixed feelings about, um, you know, trying to get Russian, rid of Russian olive in some areas. And then um, here's just a picture of a singular tamarisk and then tamarisk um, monoculture along our rivers. And it's a deciduous tree that's got a shrub-like form and it can, um, as I just mentioned, form these dense monocultures. And there's several different species that can be found in uh, the western United States and they tend to hybridize. Um, Ramesissima and Chinensis are the two tamarisk species that we primarily deal with. And then down in Mexico you'll find Aethyl tamarisk, which is a really huge tree-like form of tamarisk and a lot of the um, residents down there use it for shade or fence posts. Um, like uh, Russian olive, tamarisk was planted on purpose for bank stabilization and also as an ornamental as well. So this map gives you kind of a perspective <laughs> of the problem we're dealing with, which it does feel that overwhelming sometimes when you get out on the river. It is the third and fourth most commonly found riparian plant species 
um, in the West after Cottonwood and Willow, which, which we're glad are the number one and two. And you know, the reason why we're, we're concerned with these particular species is that they can form um, these dense monocultures that outcompete the native plants. And we want the native plants because they provide the correct habitat and food sources for wildlife species, whereas tamarisk and Russian olive are usually pretty subpar habitat for the native species we'd like to be seeing, um, both um, for fish and wildlife. And, you know, they were brought in to help stabilize banks, and they've done a really good job of that, a too, too good of a job. So we've lost a lot of the sinuosity that we're supposed to be seeing in these desert rivers. We're losing side channels, and the banks are just becoming really cemented, and you're not getting the overbank flooding and flow that we'd like to see to help regenerate native plants. So that's a huge issue. And then, you know, as you boaters and, and people that like to get out in the river know, it's really hard to access the river in a lot of these areas. Um, I'll have some pictures of Grand Junction where you can see you, you, couldn't, even, you wouldn't even know there was a river there. Um, and then, as this picture indicates, uh, tamarisk in particular can increase wildfire along riparian areas, which don't typically experience a fire regime. You know, when you've got a lush cottonwood and willow gallery, you're not seeing wildfires. Um, as much as I dislike tamarisk, you really got to admire it because it is pretty incredible, um, the things that it can do. Uh, the top picture shows the, the numerous seeds that it produces each year. I've heard upwards of 500,000 per plant, and they are dispersed um, both by wind and water. And you can see it is really pretty when it is in bloom. Um, it's amazing because it can survive not only drought, but it can also survive flood for a long time. And it's really salt tolerant. So it's able to take advantage of subpar lands that you might find in altered river systems. And it does really well on low nutrient soils, which other species d don't, don't do so well on. Um, it's long lived. Here's some pictures of it um, thriving. I uh, just read that it can be live up to 75, 100 years, maybe even more. Um, and then here's some pictures where you can see how it out, can outcompete natives when it forms these thickets. And there's a, a large machine for scale. It's, you can see it's hard for anything else to even access lighter nutrients in those conditions. And not only does it cause fires, or not cause them, but um, perpetuate fires, it is resilient. So after a fire like this goes through, it'll just re-sprout, whereas a cottonwood or willow probably won't be coming back after it's a blaze like that goes through. So tamarisk can be controlled in a lot of different ways. Um, and typically, these are used in concert with one another. Um, one of the techniques we typically employ is mechanical treatment. So we work with different contractors that have mulching equipment. And you can see in the, the picture there, one of the smaller mulching heads, that's a machine that we use on a lot of our projects. Especially if there are a few clumps of natives, um, this operator can be very selective and um, just hit the invasive species and leave what we want to um, foster along. And then um, chemical treatments are also very common, and chemical treatments often have to be used in concert with these mechanical treatments because the tamarisk will re-sprout. So you'll have to go back, you know, in six months or a year later and get the, the re-sprouts that come up. Um, while I said that it is fire adapted, people have used prescribed fire in the past and then followed up with a chemical treatment. And then what I want to focus on tonight, just because I think it's really pretty fascinating, is the use of biological control um, for tamarisk. So I'm sure you guys are all pretty familiar with the general concept of biological control, where you add a, a native um, herbivore to a species is, that has been introduced. So when tamarisk and Russian olive were brought over, they didn't come over with their natural herbivores or enemies that would keep that species in check in its natural habitat. So the idea is just to bring the invasive plant into some sort of equilibrium, not to, to completely eradicate that but just bring it down to more manageable levels. And so the species that's used here in the Western US is um, called the tamarisk beetle, and it's, the genus is Diarabda. And I'll pass around. They're kind of hard to see, but there's a few adult beetles in here that you guys can take a look at. You have to look pretty closely. And then there's a little handout in there that's got um, the uh, life cycle. So you can see they're really small, so it might be kind of hard to see them in they're there. Waxy. Yeah, they, they are kind of waxy. Um, 
This is, you'll see this in, when it goes around, but these are the different life stages of the beetle. So you can see the larva there, and then there's three different instars of the larva, and this is the, the third instar that you can see here. And it's actually the larva that do the most damage, damage to the tamarisk plants, and I've heard some entomologists refer to them as the hungry teenagers of the bunch. And um, <laughs> it's not really, the adults are too busy procreating to be eating much, and so it's their offspring that are, that are eating the tamarisk. Um, just to provide a brief background on the testing that went into before bringing the biological controls into the United States, um, this is the, I've heard the most heavily researched biocontrol agent, and that makes sense. I mean, the ramifications of, are huge of bringing any biocontrol agent in, but especially one that eats uh, a woody, you know, a large woody plant. So back in 87, a group of scientists went over and first started looking overseas to see what the natural predators of tamarisk were in its um, host countries. And then, you know, spent 20 years researching to make sure that these insects would only eat tamarisk. And so it wasn't until 2001 that they did um, limited open releases. And one of the first ones was um, near S in Cisco near Moab. So I'm primarily, uh, for this area, I'm talking more mostly about the um, northern tamarisk beetle, but there are different species. And this will come into play when I show you some of the mapping that's been done over time. But there are four different species that are present in the United States. And each of these was introduced in its comparable um, ecosystem in the U.S. So like the Mediterranean beetle, for example, is, um, d does a better job in California where there's a more Mediterranean climate. And so we've got the beetle that we have was originally from Kazakhstan and Chalik, China, I believe. And apparently we have a similar um, habitat type here in the West. <laughs> and this is how serious people are about the beetle. This is um, Dr. Tom Dudley, <laughs> who um, here he was as a younger man collecting beetles with Dan Bean, who um, works at the Palisade Insector, who also has a matching tattoo. <laughs> so, yeah, he, they, uh, they just got these a couple years ago. It was a big hit at our conference. <laughs> So this gives you an idea of um, the beetles in action, and like I said, here's the larva that are all, you know, conglomerated on the tamarisk and munching away. And it's, you know, you, how many of you have seen the beetles at work while you've been on the rivers? A few of you guys? Okay. Yeah. So they can be pretty intense. And one of our old jobs was to go through and do sweeps for the beetles. We, do, we did a lot of mapping with the tamarisk coalition, and then just be, you know, you're just covered in them when you've got the sweep nets out. So to give you an idea of what the beetle's doing on a landscape scale, I wanted to show you a few pictures. These are from the Virgin River in southern Nevada. And this is on June 1st, 2010. Um, everything looks you know, pretty greened up. And then this is when the beetles moved in. And this is 20 days later. So you can see that they can have a large impact in a relatively short period of time. And these numbers on the bottom um, are referring to the impacts of the beetle on the southwestern willow flycatcher. Um, this is the, and before I go into that, this, this is just on a smaller scale in Matt, Colorado. So just to the west of Grand Junction, this is a private landowner that had worked with Insectary to, to release the beetle. So just another example of, of the impact it's having. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are really embracing the beetle because it's cutting down on management costs and time. But I would be rather remiss if I didn't mention the southwestern willow flycatcher, which is a neotropical bird that, um, you know, as its name indicates, prefers willow. But in the absence of um, willow habitat, when you're looking at, you know, there's a river that runs th through here and there's no willow, it's taken to nesting in tamarisk. And so it'll come in. Um, in the beginning of June and think everything's fine, it'll build its nest, and then the beetle comes in and suddenly the eggs are exposed and they get baked in the sun or they get picked off by different predators. And so in 2009, when the beetle moved into the Virgin River uh, watershed, they saw a 75% drop in nesting success for this endangered bird. So it's been a huge issue that a lot of different land managers are contending with. And one of our goals is to try to provide information um, to different land managers to let them know where the beetle is moving and let them uh, try to get some restoration activities in place beforehand so that these birds have some refugia to go to. Um, so this graphic just describes what I was talking about. You know, they, they get on the 
the site, they build their nest, they have their eggs, as chicks start to come out, and then bam, the beetles come in, and things don't go so well for them. And the tamarisk will come back year after year. So the beetle will come in, it'll look dead, and then you know it'll have just enough reserves in its roots to, to survive. And so it puts all its energy into photosynthesizing. So this is kind of what you'll see the tamarisk looking like after it's been defoliated in some areas. So this, this issue is pretty pertinent for the birds because they could come back the next year and think everything's fine again, and then it gets defoliated. And I think they are seeing a, a move into the native habitat when it exists, but sometimes they just don't have those options. Um, whether or not the biocontrol kills the tamarisk is really dependent on the different site conditions that you'll find. So we're finding along the Colorado River where the tamarisk have good water and have the roots in the water, um, it can be several years before you're really seeing those tamarisks die back. But if you have stuff that's more isolated at like a intermittent wash or something, you can see them die off more quickly. So it, it really depends on what's going on. Um, Throughout the system, though, scientists are finding that there has been a drastic reduction in, in flowering, so hopefully we're not getting quite as many seeds into the system, and they are seeing a lot of, you know, branch mortality, so they're dying off slowly, but, you know, as you can see in this picture here, most of this looks pretty dead, but that's actually only at 60% mortality, and these are folks from the Palisade Insectary that have been doing a lot of heavy-duty monitoring at specific sites um, in the Colorado Basin. So one of the jobs that the Tamarisk Coalition has undertaken is compiling data on the, the distribution of the beetle. And nobody had really been doing this. I mean, they were released at select sites, and then they were off into the world. And so um, our former founder um, realized that somebody should probably be out there collecting data on where these beetles were. So when I first started at the coalition, we had a bunch of staff on board, and we all got to go boating every year, and it was great fun. <laughs> and, and now we don't do that anymore. We mostly just collect data from our partners <laughs> who get to go out on the river. Um, just to explain this map a little bit, the um, red dots are where is the year 2007, and that's where the beetles were initially established when we first started doing our monitoring. And then the colors spread out from there. So you can see the orange in 2008, they kind of went a little further up the Colorado River, a little further downstream. And then the yellow is 2009, green is 2010. And then by 2011, you can see that the beetles um, were well established in northern Arizona, down in the Grand Canyon also along um, the Virgin River. And then on the Arkansas River, that was a release that the insectary did. So if you're wondering why they suddenly made it over the divide and started populating over there, it's because they were trucked over there. Are those dot colors cumulative or are they exclusive to that? It, it's cumulative, yeah. And I used to have all the years in there, but it was just kind of confusing. Um, and then back to those four other Sub, or species that I mentioned earlier, we started collecting more data from other partners. So this map and the next couple will show we started getting data from people that were tracking the beetle in um, California and Nevada and then partners that we had in um, Texas. So this is um, after we started including those data and you can see those other species are well established in um, along the Rio Grande and have spread down into Mexico as well. And they're also, you know, on the Panhandle in Oklahoma. And then this is our latest map, and this um, was just completed a month or so ago from this last summer. So you can see that they're um, really making their way. And so the, the big area of concern for the southwestern willow flycatcher is not on Speedy PC Pro. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> So um, <laughs> the la some of the last strongholds for the southwestern willow flycatcher are down on the San Pedro and Gila rivers. And um, while the, the beetle that's prevalent in our area is moving south, there's probably more likelihood that these beetles from the Albuquerque area are going to head that way. Um, so we've been working with folks down there to try to get some willows established so that the, the birds have somewhere to go. And I, I just had to throw this guy in here. This is the... Um, tamarisk weevil, and there wasn't any real research done on this guy, but it, it's another herbivore of tamarisk, and nobody really knows how it got into the system, but it's here, and I think it's pretty cool looking, and I like to look for its egg cases when I'm out, because they're just so intricate, and um, you can, it's a lot easier if you're looking at the tamarisk to find the egg cases than the actual weevil, but they're really beautiful, <laughs> so if you're out on the river, take a look for them, and I, I, they're all over Grand Junction area, and you'll find them um, in concert with the tamarisk beetles. 
So switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about different watershed partnerships that are addressing restoration in the Colorado Basin. And I'm going to um, talk about three different groups. I'm going to start out a little further and then move closer to home. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Escalante River Watershed Partnership Group. And this group, unlike some of the other groups we work with, is primarily focused on Russian olive management. They've had a huge issue with Russian olive moving into their river and just really changing how that river functions and, and the access to that river. If you're not familiar with the Escalante River, um, it's in remote southeast Utah, and it's a tributary to the Colorado with its terminus in, in Lake Powell, and it's a gorgeous spot if you haven't been out there. I, I won't go through the missions of all these different groups, but I just want to point out that a lot of the, these watershed partnership groups have pretty similar um, goals, and that's to restore the ecological function of these rivers and involve um, community stewards in doing so, similar to the Tamaris Coalition um, mission. So this is what the river looked like before treatment started and forced, and you can see Russian olives really dominating the, the banks of the river. And this is what it looks like two years after treatment, which I'm completely jealous of because working in the areas that we do that have a lot of different secondary weeds and not as much overbank um, flooding, we don't really see these kind of results here. But the, none of this was planted. This all came in on its own, and it's all um, native cottonwoods and willows, which is, you know, what was found a lot through this system before. And, you know, there's research being going on to, to see what it historically looked like. It's a very dynamic system, but... These are definitely species that we would desire in this, in this area. Um, this work wouldn't have been possible without um, support from the, the partnership and all the different people that are involved in it. They primarily utilize um, conservation cores to get their work done because it's such remote settings. These kids are camping out for weeks at a time all throughout the, the fall and, and summer. Um, the group has been really great on providing education and getting different scientists involved. So they've got a study going on right now to look at legacy cottonwood stands to see, you know, how old a lot of those, those cottonwood trees are and what condition they're in. And then they're also looking at um, the cut stumps from the Russian olive to see how old those trees are and what conditions, you know, trying to correlate that to the weather conditions to see if we can look for those conditions in the future to see if there's another event that might propagate more Russian olive in the future. And like all the other partnerships, they have an extensive um, monitoring program. So there's a couple scientists out here putting in some long-term monitoring plots as well to, to assess vegetation change. Um, they've prioritized over 7,000 acres for Russian olive treatment, and to date they've treated about 6,000 of those acres, which is really impressive. And they've restored about 90 miles of the river in the process. Um, they've created over 400 jobs, and a lot of those have been with young adults um, throughout the, the Colorado Basin and the, the Four Corners. Um, moving a little closer to home, the Dolores River Restoration Partnership um, they're primarily focused on tamarisk management and restoration, but like these other groups, also have a monitoring, education, and social management goals. And they're focused on a 175-mile stretch of river, if you're not familiar with the, the Dolores, um, that runs through um, Colorado and Utah and then um, dumps into the Colorado River upstream of um, Moab. And um, they primarily work with the BLM districts that manage this area, and then they have a handful of private landowners as well that they work with. This is the typical of some of their sites that they're seeing. This is um, tamarisk that's been affected by beetle, and um, then you can see there's an understory of Russian knapweed here. I don't, I don't know if you can see that, but that's what a lot of that is underneath there is invasive Russian knapweed. And then there's a few smattering of natives in there. And then this is what it looks like after treatment with a masticating head on that orange um, Kubota that I showed you earlier. And then three years later, this is what it looks like after the Russian knapweed's been treated. So we've got a good, healthy native understory. Um, we've got like um, alkali sacatone and different salt grasses, three-leaf sumac, New Mexico privet. And not that there's not more work that could be done on this site, but we're really seeing it on a positive trajectory towards a more native ecosystem. Um, like the Escalani, they also rely really heavily on conservation cores, and then they also have a lot of contractors that they work with as well. 
Um, they, the Dolores Partnership does a ton of outreach, not only within the partnership, but outside of it as well. And they really try to bring back lessons learned from their work over the last um, six or seven years. So they meet at least four times a year, and then they've got a bunch of different subcommittee meetings, and they get out in the field and talk with the land managers and the landowners and really try to figure out what works. So really employing adaptive management techniques to get the best results that they can. Their accomplishments are also pretty uh, extensive. They've treated about 1,400 acres out of 1,900 acres that they prioritized. And out of that, they're seeing the results I want to see on about 1,200 acres. And so on those other couple hundred acres, they're still continuing to do different treatments to try to get the native component um, in a better spot. <laughs> They've also created a ton of jobs for Conservation Corps members and contractors and have had a ton of volunteer support as well. And the latest figures we've had as far as money that's been invested in local economies is up to over $6 million, which is pretty incredible when you think about how remote these rivers are and just the people that are, are invested in, in seeing improvements on these rivers. So the Desert Rivers Collaborative is um, the most near and dear to my heart. It's um, the group that I'm trying to coordinate. Um, we formed in 2012, and we're a little more uh, loose-knit group of folks than some of these other partnerships. And we haven't had um, a lot of the same uh, funding that some of these other groups have had, but we're still trying to do um, as best of a job as we can. And we're focused on the Colorado River from the um, uh, Garfield County line to the Utah-Colorado state line, and then the lower Gunnison from the confluence, maybe I'll show you a map, uh, the confluence down um, to the city of Delta. And um, we have both Tamarisk and Russian Olive, but I'd say the majority of our work is with um, Tamarisk. Uh, this is, if you're driving into Grand Junction over the 5th Street Bridge, if you're coming from Delta, this is what it used to look like. And actually, prior to this, this was all filled with junk cars. And then there was a uranium mill tailing site just on the other side of this. So we've had a lot of legacy <laughs> of abuse on the Colorado River. And so it really makes for some restoration challenges. So that's why I'd say I'm a little jealous of the Escalani River. Um, but, you know, this is all uh, Tamarisk and Russian Olive. And then this is what it looked like after that was all cleared out. And, you know, there's still not a, a great mid-story, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the understory, but this gives you an idea of, of, of what we're shooting for. Um, this area is actually now a, being developed as a regional park, and that's kind of changed the trajectory of our restoration plans. We would have liked to have done more planting in this area, but now um, there's a disc golf course out there, and there's going to be... Um, a stadium built on the other side of it outside of the floodplain and you know I, I kind of struggled with that at first but in a lot of respects I think it's really gotten the community more involved and more engaged with the river there's now a brewery down here as well so we're seeing a lot more visitation on the river and I think that's helping to garner support for what we're trying to do um, this is a smaller scale project that I was involved with last year this is also city of Grand Junction property and this is a wash that runs uh, basically through suburbia and Grand Junction, and it's also being developed as a, a park. Um, this is what it looked like all choked with Tamarisk and Russian Olive prior to treatment. Um, and then this is the one spot where we've actually had some pretty good passive restoration, and this is what it looked like just a couple months later. So I'm pretty um, pleased with the results of this. We did do some planting of cottonwood poles, but other than that, all the grasses and willows came in on their own. So we've, um, over the years, even prior to the development of the partnership, have treated a lot of acres, probably, probably about 1,800 1, acres, but a lot of them really do need follow-up and maintenance, and that's something I'm really trying to work on this year to get a better feeling for where we need to go back. And, you know, I think the, there's a sea change of people realizing just how much time and commitment and money needs to go in maintaining these sites. And so I think we're at a good point in our community now where we can hopefully get some more momentum by, behind that and people are realizing the benefit that this work um, does. Uh, we also work with a lot of Conservation Corps uh, employees through the Western Colorado Conservation Corps and are really trying to get the community engaged. There's a picture up there of um, Pete Furman from Colorado Parks and Wildlife working with a middle school group. So it's cool to see a lot of these kids getting out on these sites too. Uh, just briefly wanted to touch on um, some of the active restoration that we do, if you're kind of wondering what I mean by that. Um, we um, have worked with the different plant materials center that are run by the Natural Resources Conservation Service to try out different types of plant materials. So you can see in that truck down there um, some tall pots that we tried. And so 
at a lot of these sites, we can't get irrigation to them. So we're trying to get the plants down into the water table or the capillary fringe because nobody's going, nobody has the manpower to go irrigate all these plants along the Colorado River. So um, you can see how tall those root systems are. And so the idea is to auger down a hole or um, use a stinger bar to get down and get those plants into some um, sustained water. Um, we did, we tried to develop ecotype or species that are specific to a particular area. So I'm out collecting plants, which I was psyched. I got to go ride my bike to go collect seeds. <laughs> along the, we we're up above the river. I don't know why we were collecting that one that particular day. But, um, and then another cool thing we did was develop a cottonwood pole plantation. So again, we went out and collected seeds and or cuttings and then worked with local nurseries to develop them into rooted cottonwoods. So I'm out here with the Conservation Corps on a private landowner's um, property, and we planted them in rows, and then the cottonwoods grow up, and then you can just go in and cut them and plant them as dormant poles into the water table, and then they'll develop roots off that. So it's, it's pretty slick. And then they'll re-sprout, and so you can cut them you know, up to three times before they lose a lot of their vigor. So. Um, I'm really excited because this is one of my first projects when I started, and I'm like, oh, I hope this works. And now um, we have a contractor that's planting 12,000 cottonwoods on a project that Parks and Wildlife did where they just cleared about 500 acres. And so they were all, you know, adapted to the area, and hopefully they do well. So it was kind of exciting to see this really come to fruition. Um, I just wanted to put a plug in for a pollinator garden we started as well. This is a more upland site, but kind of a, a pet project of mine to try to raise more awareness about pollinators in our area. And um, we've had some mixed success with this, but I think most of these species are still there. We did about 1,300 different plantings, but we also had a huge issue with kochia um, obscuring a lot of the plantings as well. So how do you know if it's working? I, I don't know if I'm really answering the question of if, is riparian restoration working, but um, we are really trying to get some metrics to to fully say if, if the approaches we're taking are having a um, lasting effect. So a lot of the partnerships are doing both short and long-term vegetation monitoring where they go out and assess what's coming in on the site. If, if they did active plantings, they want to see if they're surviving. They want to see if there's other weed infestations. And so the, the short-term monitoring is really to help inform managers so that the next year they can go back and say, we need to treat knapweed again. We need to watch out for beaver that are cutting down our cottonwoods and, and just come up with an annual work plan. And then that monitoring and then um, some more intensive monitoring is helping these managers to decide whether they're me meeting their goals over the long term for these sites. Um, we've partnered with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies to do some um, bird monitoring, and then there's other partners that are doing wildlife um, and geomorphic monitoring as well. Um, Briefly wanted to mention a cottonwood study that we did on the Dolores River, and this was to really help inform active restoration. So we knew that there were some parameters that we should meet in order for cottonwoods to be successful, but we really wanted to go out and test those. So we um, sampled the water that we were planting the cottonwoods into, as well as the soil. We looked at texture, salinity, and, and pH. And then for the water, we looked at how how deep you had to drill to get down to the groundwater, and then also the salinity and the pH of the water. The, the study took place on the Dolores, and um, they went along um, about 124 miles of the, of the Dolores and visited 21 sites. And then they only planted if they met specific parameters, and that was if there was um, low enough salinity, there was enough dry soil above where the water was saturated, or the ground was saturated, and then they didn't plant if it was high saline or if they obviously hit bedrock, or if they were just getting mucky anaerobic soils. And um, monitoring was done in 2014 and 15, and despite the fact that we only planted on these particular parameters, um, we had a, only a 50% survival rate, which I thought at first seemed pretty poor, but talking to other folks that um, do restoration for a living, they said that this actually wasn't too bad. And, um, but th the real benefit of the study was that the, the data that were collected were then later analyzed by um, Fort Lewis, a scientist at Fort Lewis, and she correlated that survival was really related to the, the um, salinity at the bottom of the hole. So we were looking at salinity and um, soil textures and pH at the bottom of the hole, the middle and the top. And so, you know, as we're moving forward, if a manager wants to do soil assessments, I guess our recommendation would be make sure that you're meeting those correct parameters at the bottom of the hole. So this kind of information is being passed along to our partners that are doing some of this active planting. 
Um, I briefly wanted to talk about a geomorphic monitoring study that we're doing. And um, Dr. Gigi Richard with Colorado Mason University just did a um, half hour presentation on this at our last Tamaris conference. And so if you're interested in learning more about this, I um, would suggest you check out her presentation, which will be up on the Tamaris Coalition website shortly. And she does a much better job of explaining this. And some of you might know Jeff Crane. We worked with him as well. He lives here in Carbondale and Hotchkiss as well. Um, but the purpose of this study was just to look at geomorphic changes after Tamarisk and Russian olive removed. So, you know, ideally you would take them out. Well, I guess it depends on what your management goals are and, and where you live. But, um, you know, if we want to see those geomorphic changes, you would think you take the Tamarisk out and then you're starting to see those, those banks move somewhat. So we wanted to see if that was actually happening um, after the treatments. So we looked at three sites that were um, cleared of Tamarisk by Colorado Parks and Wildlife in the Grand Junction area. So um, two upstream from downtown Colorado River Island and Franklin Island, and then um, one downstream Walter Walker um, State Wildlife Area. And um, the study included both field surveying and then a GIS aerial photo analysis to look at the rates of change um, pre and post Tamarisk removal. And so we did cross sections at the sites that I just talked about before the Tamarisk and Russian olive removed and then after and then um, Gigi an analyzed that. And then she and her students also did this aerial photo GIS analysis and they, that included sites that were done as far back as the um, late 1990s as well. So she looked at a 50 kilometer reach and she looked at um, two different time periods, 2002 to 2007 and then 2007 to 2012. And the reason that she looked at the two different sites was um, differences in um, flood frequency during those time periods. And so this picture gives you um, a better feel for some of the <laughs> bank instability that might result. And, you know, we don't have a definitive answer of whether this was correlated to tamarisk removal or not, but you can see that this particular site um, in five years eroded pretty significantly. So this can be of concern to um, land managers in the, in the Grand Junction area that might not want to lose the Colorado Riverfront Trail or their <laughs> riverfront property. Um, so this is the um, annual peak flow in those two different time frames that I mentioned. And so um, the reason Gigi broke it out into the two different times is because there was um, a lot more water in the system in that latter time period. So again, there's a lot more that went into this, um, and I can give any of you the, the PowerPoint that she did if you'd like more information. But generally speaking, um, there were higher um, erosion, average annual erosion rates in that higher, in, in those years between 2007 and 2012. Um, with tamarisk removal, they were seeing um, erosion rates at 2.2 meters per year, and if there weren't, wasn't removal, it was only 1.4 meters per year. So um, it was a significant difference. And we haven't seen that yet at the sites that we did the field studies, but we will um, be going back out um, this year and in years, um, years coming as long as we're getting good overbank flooding that might help mobilize those banks. How am I doing? I probably should speed up here. So I'm almost done here. Um, I briefly want to talk about an expert panel report that the Tamaris Coalition just completed, um, also in coordination with Colorado Mesa University. And this, um, the purpose of this report was really to try to synthesize all the information out there by the Tamarisk, about the Tamarisk um, beetle and the impacts it's having on the health of our rivers and what we can expect in the future. Um, if you'd like a copy of this, feel free to contact me or you can also download it on our website. Um, the, basically, the long-term outlook is that the beetles will continue to expand, kind of like I showed you on that map earlier. The, they'll continue to move down into Arizona and spread in, in Texas um, and Mexico. And, you know, it, the effects of the beetle will really depend on what's in the system. If there's native plants present and the, the beetle has a real impact on the tamarisk, you know, there's a good chance that those native plants will take advantage of the, the nutrients and light that are exposed and thrive. But if there's kochia and knapweed in the system, you know, we're looking at more herbaceous weed issues. So there's going to be a need for continued management at these sites um, regardless. Um, the panel also found that over time we should see a reduction in wildfire risk, you know, as the tamarisk dies back. And, you know, even if it is replaced by more herbaceous uh, invasive species, they're probably not as flammable. And then like we just discussed with the um, 
geomorphic study, we'll probably see more channel mobility as the tamarisk dies back, especially as those roots start to decompose along our along the banks. But the, again, that'll really depend on the natural flow regime. So in an unregulated river where you're getting a lot of overbank flooding, you'll probably see that mobilize a lot more quickly than a dam regulated system where you're just getting a pittance of water running through a system and doesn't have that energy to unstabilize those banks. So, you know, all told, we should see some benefits to um, wildlife abundance and diversity, especially when the beetles in concert with other restoration activities. Um, this is a picture from the Dewey Bridge site in um, Moab, near Moab, and you can see that we're getting a lot of willows coming up um, after the beetles affected um, tamarisk. So I guess in summary, in trying to tie this all together is that, you know, we've got some really good management tools out there. We've got the Tamarisk beetle in the system, but it's really going to take continued effort from different partnership groups that are out there um, working in tandem to have an impact on the regional scale. And I think we're really fortunate in this area that there are so many different groups that are working well together and um, making some pretty big strides towards healthy rivers. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Tamarisk Coalition, we have, um, of course, a, a website and a Facebook page that's updated fairly regularly. If you'd like to um, head out on the river with us, we're doing a river trip in um, Albuquerque on April 30th. And if you don't want to go that far, we're going to have a river trip on August 27th in Grand Junction. This will be our third annual trip and it's a lot of fun. Um, we will have a band at the end and we do this in concert with um, Rim Rock Adventures that's, which is located in Fruta. So it's a really good time and we've been trying to get a lot more um, experts on board to talk about different things that are going on on the river. So it's a good learning opportunity. So with that, thanks. The question was, does the beetle eat anything else? And um, no, it just eats tamarisk. And it, they did a ton of host specificity testing to see if it would eat anything else, and it would just starve other than eat another plant. Um, it, there was one genus, Frankenia, that I guess it showed some preference for, but they haven't found any issues with that um, moving forward. The weevil, too? I don't know. I'm pretty sure. But yeah, they haven't done a lot of studies on the weevil, but we haven't seen any associated brownouts of other plants since it's been found in the in the system it's been in the system for quite a while now yeah is, is there a russian olive beetle um no <laughs> no and um i i think i was in the other room during our, if you guys are interested we do um we do an annual conference every year we just had our last one a couple weeks ago um but dan bean from the palisade insectary did a talk on the on russian olive biocontrol and they don't, I think they are looking at developing something, but they don't want anything that will kill the whole tree, only stop seed production, because some people do enjoy having Russian olive in their yard, and so that, that's what they're exploring now. But his talk will be up online, too, if you want to find out kind of where they're at with that. And I'm sorry, I don't know the exact time frame, but I think it, the feeling I've gotten is it's a ways off. <laughs> yeah. First, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation that was really well done. Thanks. It really was. <laughs> Then I was just curious, are there any species that thrive on eating the beetles? Yeah, I th there have been a lot of studies about that as far as um, birds go. Um, Charles Van Riper at the University of Arizona has done a lot of work to try and see if birds are kind of adapting to that. And I think it's kind of a mixed bag, really, of who's thriving off of it. And I think um, spiders actually like the eggs and the larvae of the tamarisk, so they're, they're doing all right because of it. But um, yeah, it kind of depends. I'm not answering your question. But there are bird species that do, and there's a lot of bird species that aren't so thrilled on it, would prefer the more natives, but it has changed the food web um, on these rivers, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Is the Siberian elm the same thing as the Chinese or the piss elm that we call? And if so, how do you eradicate those? Yeah, it's, you know, I'm not quite... We, we usually say Siberian, but I think they've been kind of used interchangeably with, with Chinese, but I'm not quite sure on the differences in those species. Um, in, the, in the valley, we always say Siberian, but um, its treatment's pretty much the same. It definitely re-sprouts. I mean, I've been trying to, I cut it every year in our yard, and every year it comes back up. So, yeah, you can, you can pluck it or masticate it, but you definitely need to have herbicide associated with it or make sure you get the whole root mass. Um, that, that's what a lot of the land managers have been doing when it's 
sprinkled in amongst the tamarisk and Russian olive. And some people are choosing to leave it because if you take it out, then it is pretty denuded. And <laughs> so we've been kind of trying to figure out how to move forward dealing with that. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming. And thanks, Shannon, one more time.